Hey folks, welcome back to TSL Movie Podcast. I'm Darren. Uh, Frank's not with us at the moment, um, but so I'm going solo for the time being. I realized recently that that we've talked so much Carpenter, but I haven't really kind of tried to put them in any sort of order. So I thought, I, I, I mean, I don't really like doing rankings, but I thought, why not? You know, have a look at it. You're a huge Carpenter fan. I would say that probably five or six of my all-time favorite top 10 movies are Carpenter movies. So let's just try and rank them. I'm going to try and do this. It's one of those things that a ranking can change, you know, on a daily basis. You know, whatever side of the bed I get out on, I can change my mind as to as to what, you know, order these would go in. So I've written them down here. I'm going to try and do this as best I can. But I would have to say that my number 10 Carpenter movie would be Escape from L.A. Um, Escape from L.A., I think, I think there, are, there are decent bits of this film. I think that there is um, enough Snake Plissken in there um, f- to keep the Snake Plissken fan happy. I know that the film as a whole is not very good. And it's a shame that it turned out like it did. You know, Carpenter was given a lot of money to do this, and I don't think he spent it in the best way. I think it was, you know, some of the ambition in there was a little bit too much for the budget, even though he was given a sizable budget for this. But also it felt like to me, like they were trying to sell Snake Plissken products or something because they put him in positions that, that, you know, Snake Plissken had never been in before. Snake Plissken playing basketball. Snake Plissken hand gliding. Snake Plissken windsurf. Was it windsurfing or surfing? Surfing. Snake Plissken surfing. And Snake Plissken on a motorbike. And it was like, Snake Plissken just walks around. He just is like that. He just, he's cool and calm. I don't want to see him hanging off the hanging off a plane or or a back of a truck or that kind of stuff. Do you know what I mean? He's a, this cool anti-hero that just does simple things. And that's how he gets through life. And like I said, too much ambition for this film. Um, it felt like I say, like they were trying to sell Snake Plissken G.I. Joe dolls or something. One with a hand glide, one with a basketball, one with a windsurf. And, you know, it, it just went too far with what they were trying to do. However, there are some great moments in there. You know, I think the whole doomsday thing where he switches off the power to the world at the end, I think is really cool. I love the the introduction to the movie where Snake comes back into it. Um, I loved Stacey Keach in the film. I thought he was good. The Surgeon General of Beverly Hills with Bruce Campbell. Great stuff. Um, But, you know, it really isn't that much different to Escape from New York. It's kind of like Escape from New York um, remade almost, but remade in a not very good way. However, I do enjoy watching it from time to time. And that's why it's uh, number 10 on my ranking. Slow it down, Pliskin. You're overloading the power plant. You slow down, dickhead. I'm the one who's dying. Okay, so number nine is Vampires. Vampires is one of those films that I haven't seen too much of um, over the years. I've probably watched it three or four times. However, I do really enjoy it. I think James Woods in this film is really strong. Um, It was interesting to see him do a Carpenter film. I know he's kind of a little bit off the map at the moment, is James Woods. But in the 80s, he was a big star. He'd done some really credible movies like Salvador and Cop. Well, there's some good news and there's some bad news. The good news is you're right, I'm a cop and I gotta take you in. The bad news is I've been suspended and I don't give a fuck. You know, all kinds of really cool stuff. And then he pops up in this John Carpenter film in the 90s, and it was like, wow, Carpenter's really working with some some decent talent at the moment. This was kind of like a comeback film for Carpenter, you know. He'd he'd had a really bad run in the 90s with things like uh, Memoirs of an Invisible Man and and In the Mouth of Madness didn't do too well and Village of the Damned or Children of the Damned, whichever one it is, I can't remember now. That didn't do too well. And so he came back with Vampires. Vampires is okay. I like it. There's some great set pieces in there. But overall, I don't think it's his strongest work. However, I love the main villain in this, whose name escapes me now, but the main villain in this film was fantastic. Although he does remind me too much of the main villain in Ghosts of Mars as well, which doesn't make this top 10, folks. Um, So yeah, so number nine is vampires. You want to kill one, you drive a wooden snake right through his fucking heart. Number eight 
is Prince of Darkness. I jostle with this one as to whether it should be higher. I haven't watched it for a couple of years, but I think because I've watched Assault and They Live and Christine recently, I think those more, are more fresh in my mind and that's why they're, they're probably higher up the list. Prince of Darkness is, is one of those films that um, it's, it's a slow burn. There's a lot going on in there, but not much happens until the kind of the sort of um, the last third of the movie in which all hell breaks loose. Then, you know, you've got this canister of liquid Satan that's found in this church. These students come in to kind of, I guess, monitor it and, and, and figure out what's going on until eventually it kind of bursts open and we get to almost see uh, the devil, but not quite. Um, I think, you know, Donald Pleasance is putting in a good show in this as well. And, you know, another kind of collaboration between him and Carpenter, along with Halloween and uh, Escape from New York. And also you've got Dennis Dunn as well, who we teamed up previously on Big Trouble in Little China with. So, yeah, so Prince of Darkness, I think, is one of these great, slow, atmospheric burns. There's some really, really disturbing moments in this film, particularly when they're looking out the building and they're seeing one of their colleagues whose name is... I think it's Frank, and he actually, who actually disintegrates in front of our very eyes. As he's relaying a message to the students. Um, incredibly disturbing moment. But uh, but yeah, the, this, this, this thing goes off the rails in the last 15, 20 minutes. Some really great moments of horror in there. And again, like I said, a really good, strong performance from Donald Pleasance. Uh, and their final collaboration, unfortunately. But yeah, I would say Prince of Darkness um, is worthy of being my number eight in this list. Okay. Show me. Okay, number seven is Christine. Christine is one of those movies that growing up I, I was kind of on and off with. Um, I think that after Halloween and The Thing and Escape from New York, I remember the trailers for for Christine and and how they were how they were claiming that the two titans of horror were coming together um, to, to 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 bring us this 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 horror film. And when I saw it, I was a little underwhelmed. You know, I'd already seen the, the James Brolin film, The Car, in the seventies. I'd seen Jewel as well, um, but this one that came along, I think I wanted more from it. And I think it's only over the years that I start to realize what a good film it actually is. I think as a kid, I either wanted Michael Myers or I wanted the horror of the thing or um, or Snake Plissken. I was kind of a little sort of put back by, by Carpenter's Christine. It didn't have any of the familiar characters that you get in the John Carpenter films. There was almost a John Carpenter universe in the early 80s, whereas different actors and actresses would appear in all the different movies that Carpenter did. So you had crossovers, like you had um, Darwin Joston, who was in The Fog and Assault on Precinct 13. You had uh, Keith David, who was in in The Thing and They Live. You would have uh, Charles Cyphers, who regularly made appearances in, in things like uh, Escape from New York, Halloween uh, 1 and 2, and also in Assault on Precinct 13 as well. Um, who else is there? Oh, Nancy Loomis would all obviously jump between Carpenter films. And so when Christine came along, you know, there was none of that kind of universe that was in, uh, in this film. And so I was a little disappointed by that. But over the years, I've really come to appreciate it, especially Keith Gordon's portrayal of, uh, of Arnie, Arnie Cunningham. Uh, it's, it's one of those films where as, there are a lot of carpenter tropes in there, a lot of stings, you know, the headlights coming on on the car and you get those sound effects. Um, it really does, um, when you boil it down, feel like a proper carpenter movie. And um, I was really looking forward to seeing the remake, which uh, has been batted around for so long now um, and was actually going to be done by um, Brian Fuller who's gone on to do the Friday the 13th series now. So I don't think we're going to be seeing that for some time. But yeah, uh, Christine, decent Carpenter film. They Live. 
so they live frank and i just talked about on the channel recently we did our best and worst of episode they live again is another carpenter film from the mid 80s or late 80s i think it was whereas i wasn't too sure about it at the time i think i was around about 15 years old when i saw this and I wasn't, it was a departure from what he normally did. It was, uh, there was a lot of social commentary there and and it wasn't a straightforward Carpenter, I guess, um, movie with a linear storyline, you know, like Halloween or The Fog is, or even The Thing to to a certain extent. This one you had to have your thinking cap on for. And and so at, at that young age, I didn't appreciate as much as I used to, as, as I do now. However, nowadays, I think it's a great film. I think the comparisons between um, what what the movie, you know, how the movie speaks to us and what's going on in society today are, are incredibly, you know, frighteningly similar. And there are some great performances in this film from the likes of Roddy Piper. Who'd have thought Roddy Hot Rod, Roddy Piper would have would have made a, a, an action star in a movie? I know he did a film called what was it called? Hell Comes to Frogtown. I seem to remember that. But one of the worst titles in the world. Um, but yeah, Rowdy Roddy Piper in this movie is one of the coolest, um, again, another sort of kind of anti-hero, if you like, um, strutting around with his checkered shirt on and his shotgun and the glasses and everything, trying his best to convince Keith David that something's not right within society. And the fight sequence... No! One of the best fight sequences of all time, but to camera, I think. Absolutely brutal street fight, which is, you know, I know a lot of people say that it's basically a WWE match, but what the hell? It works well on screen and uh, great story, great pacing. And by the end of the film, you're just left with a nasty taste in your mouth as to what's happened. And that's 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 one of the the, the kind of the tropes of a Carpenter film. He always likes to have a sting in the tail at the end. Whether you're talking about Escape from New York when he's walking down the street pulling the tape out, Escape from LA when he shuts the power off to the world. Uh, what else we got? Big Trouble in Little China when the, the monster comes out on the back of Jack Burton's truck. Uh, the thing is ambiguous as well, where the two of them are left, as, you know, the two survivors at the end, Keith David and Kurt Russell. Um, what's going on there? Halloween. You know, the, the Michael Myers getting shot out of the window and then disappearing. And then the fog with Hal Holbrook's decapitation. Yeah, it, it's it's one of those things that he loves to do. He loves to give you that little bit more at the end of his movies. And, you know, he's, he's created some of the most memorable finales in history because of that. <laughs> this is the siege. <laughs> it's a goddamn siege. Next on the list, Assault on Precinct 13. Assault on Precinct 13 is one of those movies where I saw this at a very young age and it really spoke to me. Uh, and I think a lot of it is because of the the, the massacre of the girl who, who was probably around the same age as me at the time. I was stunned by it as a kind of eight or nine year old watching this film, seeing Kim Richards uh, getting assassinated like that in the street. And Kim Richards, by the way, he's the sister of uh, Kyle Richards uh, from Halloween. Seeing her getting gunned down like that at point blank was just absolutely, you know, it really stained my memory as a kid. Uh, and the film really stayed with me. And not just that moment, the, the whole film, which is about characters pulling together to to solve a uh, to solve a huge crisis or a huge problem, um, you, you know, the villains and the police joining forces to beat off these gangs. Beat off these gangs? Did that sound right? No, to win over these gangs, to get rid of them, to flush them out from the police station in which they are invading. Um, it was, you know, it's it's a really super violent movie, an amazing score, great performances from uh, the likes of Austin Stoker, Darwin Joston, Laurie Zimmer. I'm not going to say um, Nancy Loomis, I think she's bloody awful in it. But um, yeah, it's <laughs> there is some amazing performances. And Charles Cyphers, Charles Cyphers pops up in there, for not for too long before he gets, uh, before he gets, sh shot to death uh, pretty brutally but um yeah it's it's one of those movies that uh, has really stayed with me since i was a, a young kid and uh, i love putting it on now and again just to hear that pulsating beat 
as as the movie starts that that score is is just terrific really is next big trouble in little china what huh what'll come out no more come on i remember the artwork for this movie in the uk and it said i just remember you know because i never saw it at the cinema um it stayed in the cinema for about a week uh and that was it and it was kind of like why? Why? This movie's fantastic. Uh, uh, you know, no wonder John Carpenter was pissed with the studios because, by all accounts, Fox messed up the market into this film. Um, but when it did come over to the UK and come out on VHS is when when I managed to see it. And I just remember holding the VHS up in the uh, in, in the video store and it said, a magical, mystical, action-adventure, comedy, kung fu, monster, ghost story. And obviously Snake Plissken's on the front cover, or Jack Burton, as he's called in this. Kim Cattrall, who I'd loved since I saw her in Mannequin a couple of years before. And then and John Carpenter. So I was in. I was absolutely in, and I couldn't believe it when I got home and put the video on. And the, the adventure movie that played out in front of me was just... It was everything, everything that a 13-year-old boy wanted at the time. And, you know, all those ingredients that they talk about on the video cover were just there in absolute droves. Some amazing set pieces in this film from the airport scene at the start all the way through to the finale with Dennis Dunn flying through the air with one of the storms. Um, Absolutely top-notch movie. And a lot of people don't realize it, but Dennis Dunn is the hero of this film. Everybody talks about Jack Burton. He's not at all. Jack Burton accomplishes nothing in this film, and that's what's great about it. You know, Kurt Russell obviously signed up to this knowing that he was going to be the butt of all the jokes within this movie. And he can't get anything right. Every time he tries to save someone or kill someone, he just screws it up all the time. I, you know, hats off to Kurt Russell, who was a big action star at the time, for signing up to this role, knowing that he was taking a backseat to Dennis Dunn, who doesn't get enough recognition at all. He's fantastic in this film. Both of them are superb. And so that's why Big Trouble in Little China is my number four on this list. Okay, next is, I mean, the next few movies are just interchangeable for me. I mean, I love them all as much as each other, I think, I'm, but I've managed to break away uh, two of them from the top slot. Uh, and the first one is The Thing. I don't know what the hell's in there, but it's weird and pissed off, whatever it is. Bennings, go get Childs. The Thing is a tremendous movie. Um, I was first introduced to The Thing back in the early 80s when um, my dad was a... Um, he was a cop. And there would be times when we would be able to go to to the police station because they had a social club there and a bar and everything, whereas we would sit down and and sit in the bar there. And one particular day that I was in there, the thing was on the TV in the background. And it was right on the moment where um, the CPR sequence is going on. And I was just absolutely gobsmacked by this. And I think it was, was, this would have been about 83. So it would have been, you know, kind of 10, 9, 10 years old or something. I'd already seen Halloween at that point. So in my head, I was a big John Carpenter fan, although I probably didn't know who John Carpenter was because I'd seen Halloween at such a young age that I don't think I appreciated um, uh, who directors were and producers and things. I think that I probably just was fixated with Michael Myers and Jamie Lee Curtis. And so it probably took me a little while to realize that the thing was the same, you know, creator as Halloween. I think we rented it not long after and watching it as a young kid, again, bit of a slow burn, but once it kicked off, I was it. I was absolutely engrossed with it. I really was. Some of the greatest practical effects of all time. I, I can honestly say some of them have never been beaten. Um, it was such a shame that the remake kind of tripped over itself in some ways because they did all the effects practically and then went back and added CG to them, which I'd like to have seen the remake without the CG just to see how, how it really fared. But Rob Bettine's work in the thing is second to none. And the movie almost broke him. As we all know, he spent over a year working on this movie. Um, but it's all there on the screen. The shocks, the scares, the great makeup, the great characters. I guess brave to put to put a film together with just 
what is there, 10 men in this film or something? Not one woman. Um, would never happen today. But yeah, the, 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 the male cast in this film is incredibly strong. Lots of kind of, and, and at a time when guys looked older than what they actually were. You know, you've got Wilfred Brimley, who's in his 40s in this film who looks like somebody in their late 60s or early 70s. Guys used to look older in the 70s and 80s for whatever reason. I don't know whether it was because there was no kind of, there was no manscaping or kind of uh, face cream or blokes didn't take care of their appearance as much as they do now. I don't know what it was, but there was something about guys in the 70s and 80s where they were real man's men uh, or men's man or man's man whatever you want to say. Uh, and they they just looked older than what they were. And so these kind of 10, 12 guys, or however many it is, it just looked like a bunch of middle-aged men, middle-aged to old-aged men arguing all the time. <laughs> but it's a great movie and a great ending. Even Kurt Russell, who's in his 20s, looks like he's in his mid-40s. Great movie, great atmosphere, still looks like it was filmed yesterday, whenever you watch it, because there's nothing there to age this film whatsoever. Maybe the odd bit of technology or something like that, but everything in this film, be it helicopters um, or the sets that they designed, they don't age at all. It, it just looks like it could have been made last year. And that's I find this movie timeless. Uh, and that's very similar to my next choice, which is Escape from New York. I don't give a fuck about your war. Or your president. Escape from New York, again, apart from the odd bit of technology in there, it kind of looks like a bit of an apocalyptic world, whereas people are living amongst rubble and things like that. It's, again, it's timeless. Apart from, obviously, uh, those, those walkie-talkies that they're hanging around with uh, or, the, or, or various other bits of technology that we see on screen. Uh, it's... it's a, a really old-fashioned, almost like a Western movie is Escape from New York. A very simple premise of going somewhere that's 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 forbidden and rescuing somebody and bringing them out. Um, again, amazing characters in this film. Lee Van Cleef as Hauk. Fantastic. Um, you've got Nick Castle in there. You've got Charles Cyphers in there. You've got Donald Pleasance playing the president. You've got Nancy Stevens in there from Halloween. Um, Frank Doubleday um who, who's in salt on precinct 13. um so again this carpenter universe of the usual alum all getting together and having a great time with a great movie that has another pulsating soundtrack and you know i think one of his uh, one of his strongest pieces of work to date so uh, you know carpenter carpenter yeah carpenter Carpenter and Kurt Russell collaborations always win out for me. And I just wish that the two of them, while there's still time, would get together and finish their um, relationship off by, by just coming up with one final movie. Close out this, uh, this, this amazing partnership over the last 30, 40 years or whatever and give us one last film. Doesn't have to be anything too serious, too big a budget, Nothing like that, but just put them together again and let's have a decent movie from Carpenter. Let's have a swan song. Let's have a final movie. Let's not sign out on the ward or go to Mars. Let's let's put this let's bookend this career with something decent. And uh, I think that the only way he can do that is to get Kurt Russell back and do a film with him. And then on to my favorite, favorite Carpenter movie, which I can't choose. As I've said before on the channel, some days I wake up and I think I prefer it to Halloween. Other days I wake up and go, I prefer it to the fog. I can't decide between the fog and Halloween as to which one of these movies is higher up on my list. So I've put them together as a joint number one. Um, Halloween is the earliest Carpenter film I ever saw. I saw it in the early 80s, probably about 81. My parents rented a VCR and we would bring it home for the weekend along with a pile of movies uh, and just watch endless films on a loop. You know, kind of we'd watch Raiders of the Lost Ark and E.T. And, and the latest James Bond film and Superman and Superman 2 and all these great movies from the late 70s, early 80s. And then one of these movies was Halloween. 
And I did a video about this on the channel a few months ago, which was called The First Time I Saw Halloween. And it had such an impact on me, did this movie, that I guess it affected me for a while because I was terrified of going to bed. I had to look under the bed every night, even though Michael had never been under a bed. Um, it, it was one of those films that just, it's embossed in my head. And I never wanted to see it again until one night it was on TV and I remember recording it on the VCR that we'd since bought. And I just became obsessed with it, like many other fans. I think it has so much to offer. I think it's so clever. I think it's so atmospheric, well written. I think it's okay. You can you can say some of the acting isn't up to standard these days, but it was just a simple. It's like a ghost train. It's just a simple story, and every so often you get those scares. <laughs> it builds. It builds throughout. It's like a coiled spring that tightens and tightens and tightens every so often and then lets go. And then it tightens and tightens and tightens again and lets go. And I've never seen a film that matches it in terms of the amount of scares that it delivers. And even now when I show it to friends or family who have never seen it, even though it's a movie from the late 70s, and with a lot of people that are around, you know, that are, that are much younger than me that would watch it today, would instantly dismiss something like that. They're impressed because it's so simple and it delivers so much. And I think that um, it's very similar with The Fog. I think that he'd taken the, uh, the ideas, that the, the things that he'd learnt from Halloween and adapted them to this small town or this, this this coastal town in the form of a ghost story and you could almost have the fog filled with countless amounts of michael myers they're shapes they're these kind of um faceless entities that are terrifying this town and for me the fog was a, like an extension of halloween but with many michael myers um, because you've got that same, you've got the same, uh, you've got Dean Cundy, you've got, um, you've got all the kind of the crew behind the original Halloween working on this film and um, recreating that similar kind of atmosphere and the similar kind of stings, but done differently um, with, again, with this amazing pulsating tune in the background. And then the, the kind of zinger at the end of the movie when every, everybody thinks everything's okay. There's one last moment where they have to come back and get the last word in. And poor Hal Holbrook knows it's coming. Um, it, it's for me, it's a, it's a, it's classic Carpenter. It's such a shame that initially it didn't do as well as people expected it to do. But over the years, I think it's gained a real kind of uh, a, a kind of loyal following, and that's that's evident in the amount of different versions that have come out over the years. And I was lucky enough to see it in the London Film Festival about three or four years ago. Um, see it on a big screen with a packed house, and it was fantastic. And just like the first time that I saw it, the audience reacted in exactly the same way. There was a lot of people that hadn't seen it before and were in there for the first time, and like that traditional carpenter ghost train that we get in halloween we got it in the fog in the theater as well and it was great to see the reaction especially when i knew what moments were coming up it was great to see people jump and be genuinely scared by this film so that's it so that's my carpenter ranking um long time coming i just wanted to share this with you because we've been covering so much carpenter recently that uh it felt right. It felt like a good time to do it, given a lot of these movies are fresh in my mind. So thanks again for supporting the channel. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, it'd be really cool if you don't mind, you know, clicking the little, where are we? Clicking the little button down there and uh, giving us a little subscribe. That would be fantastic. We continue to grow and um, it's a great journey. It really is. And I thank everyone who's supported us so far. Okay, that's me done. See you later, folks. Bye-bye.